Radioactive material is deadly if not treated with the respect it deserves. And this statement carries over to equipment that harnesses radioactive sources. An incident in 2010 would follow many similarities to an event 30 years before. And although the scientific community was shocked at the time, lessons were clearly not learned. In this video we are looking at the Mayapuri radiological accident and I think the most recent subject I've covered on this channel proves that radiological incidents were not just a thing of the Cold War. Now we have recently covered an incident from India and that got me interested in any other accidents and Mayapuri kept on popping up in the comments. The incident would result in a death toll of one, however the whole neighbourhood would feel the effects and it would remind a nation of a not so distant scar on the public psyche. Mayapuri is in the west of Delhi, which is around here on a map. The area was known for its scrap metal and automotive parts merchants, and because of this, metal from all over the world found its way to the area. In total, around 4,000 businesses operated from the junkyards in the region. Workers in the junkyards do 12 to 14 hour shifts, getting them around £90 a month which is not great. The area was pretty run down with piles of rusting pipes, partially dismantled cars and other industrial waste. Like most metal reclamation places, Mayapuri looked pretty ugly with pieces of junk metal yet to be sold off. Saying that, there are still plenty of places similar to this in London. The area contained the Government of India Press and a Food Corporation of India site. However, the busy neighbourhood was mainly populated with scrap metal shops. The developed world for years had exported metallic waste to developing countries. A growing concern of worker long-term chronic health conditions has been raised. Many contaminated metals from electronics and industry have been shipped to countries like China and India. Much of this waste ends up in small scrap merchants like the ones that live and work out of Mayapuri. However, the cause of the Mayapuri radiological incident was from a domestic supplier rather than from imported waste. In February 2010, a scrap dealer unknowingly bought a Cobalt 60 irradiator from an auction that was put on sale by Delhi University. The Gamma irradiator was originally purchased by the Delhi University for use by the chemical department from a Canadian manufacturer in 1968 and was condemned in 1985. It was in the department for experimental analysis of the effect of gamma rays on chemicals. Between 1985 and 2010, the irradiator languished in university storage. Before being sold off, no one thought to test it for residual contamination. This was in direct conflict with the rules set out by the AERB, the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. Cobalt-60 is used in many applications in the science field. The main advantage of Cobalt-60 is that it is a high intensity gamma ray emitter and it lends itself well to the treatment of cancer, industrial radiography, food and blood irradiation and the sterilization of medical equipment. However, the cobalt in this video was inside a condemned machine and was forgotten about waiting to be found. The machine was a gamma cell model 220 manufactured by Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. The machine used 16 cobalt 60 pencils kept inside a source cage inside a leg casing weighing around 3 tonnes. And it was designed not to be accessible by human hands and is categorised by the IAEA as a category 1 piece of equipment. The cage did have a maximum capacity of 48 pencils. Each pencil had 7 cobalt 60 slugs and a dummy spacer. After the auction the gamma cell reached Harcher and Singh Bola, a local scrap dealer, and was dismantled over March in Mayapuri. He took the iron parts off the unit and sold it to another shop owner. The remaining parts of the cell moved into the possession of Giriyaj Gupta, who in turn stripped any more metal off of it. Then parts of the cell were sold to Deepak Jain. This meant that parts of the Cobalt 60 pencils had been exposed during its chain of ownership. For around two weeks the Cobalt 60 pencils were kept in a couple of shops and even in the wallet of one of the scrap merchant workers. After one week of exposure, one of the workers experienced hyperpigmentation on his hands and arms, as well as loss of hair and nausea. On the 4th of April 2010, the first victim reported to the A&E department of the AIIMS New Delhi Hospital. He was treated with suspected radiation sickness. With the 32 year old in care in the hospital, on the 7th doctors reported their findings to their superiors. 
The hospital management informed the Natural Disaster Management Authority because the patient had symptoms indicative of suspected exposure to radiation and also to request advice on a further course of action to take. The AERB was also informed at this time and set out to find out where and how this exposure had happened. On the night of the 8th, officials from the AERB and emergency response agencies arrived at a scrapyard in Mayapuri and undertook a detailed survey of the area, identifying Cobalt 60 as the culprit. They discovered the original shop and a number of other shops had elevated levels of radiation and the area was cordoned off by the police. The levels recorded in the area were 10 to 15 millisieverts an hour at the entrance of the identified shop, 20 millisieverts an hour in a shop located to the rear, 15 to 45 millisieverts an hour in a shop 300 meters away, and 0.25 to 0.45 millisieverts an hour in a shop located adjacent to the original identified shop. After these readings were taken, the identified shop door was opened, and with the help of a teletector, four pencil sources, three gunny bags, and one drum containing radioactive scrap were recovered and transferred into a transport container. The initial search and disposal went on until the afternoon of the 9th. Another survey was undertaken and levels of 10 to 100 microsieverts were found at another shop. The search of the shop yielded another pencil and source cage of 25 centimeters in diameter with another source pencil still intact inside. Between the 8th and the 13th of April, six more people were admitted into hospital with varying levels of exposure. Two of the total seven received radiation burns, and one of them died as a result. But we'll cover the victim a bit later. But first, let's look at the clear-up efforts. On the 16th, the AERB were informed of a person reporting to hospital a couple of days earlier with localised radiation injury, and it was discovered that he had one of the missing pencils in his wallet. Because the pencils had been cut up, the spread of contamination meant that around 400 kilograms of soil and 100 kilograms of scrap metal had to be disposed of. Even after this, some level of contamination was measured, so the decision of pouring concrete on the affected road was taken. In total, six inches was poured over the affected area, and levels were eventually measured down to be in line with background radiation levels. By May, it was reported that all Cobalt 60 was recovered, marking the end of the event. The items that were recovered were examined and found to not have come from an Indian manufacturer, this eventually led investigators to identifying the manufacturer of the gamma cell and who it was sold to. In May, the AERB conducted an awareness program for scrap dealers to be aware of the signs of radiation sickness and the types of items that could be contaminated. This brings us back to the victims of the event. Six of seven were discharged from hospital, with the last leaving on the 24th of May. Regular checkups were undertaken until fully discharged from outpatient care. However, one person would fall victim to the contamination. The 26-year-old was admitted on the 9th of April, with a predicted exposure time of two weeks. He had been working in the shop for between 12 to 15 hours a day in the vicinity of the Cobalt 60 source, leaving a long time of exposure. During his treatment, he informed medical professionals that he had removed some of the protective lead and had touched one of the pencils. Leading up to admission, he had reported at least two cases of bleeding gums per day and that his fingers and toes had gone black. At the time of admission, his vitals were stable. However, by the fourth day of hospitalisation, he had developed pneumonia. Transplants of platelets took place and a bone marrow biopsy was taken, confirming bone marrow suppression. Despite the treatment, his condition deteriorated and was moved to ICU 15 days after admission and passed away on the 24th of April 2010. A dose of 3.1 grays was detected in the victim whilst in hospital. After death, the body was deemed to be safe to be handled and was sent for autopsy. After notes from treatment and an autopsy was conducted, the cause of death was concluded to be shock due to septicemia consequent to acute radiation exposure. The subsequent investigation into the origin of the source led authorities to the New Delhi University. As a result, the university was banned from using Cobalt 60 and six professors were charged with criminal negligence, endangering life. After the IAEA was informed of the event, they placed it as a level 4 on the INES scale. Recommendations were sent out for detectors at the entrance to scrap markets and for individual shop owners to have detection equipment. However, these weren't brought in 
even as late as six years post-event. The event left a scar on the area with local trade decreasing. However, pollution would not go away due to the type of work conducted in the neighbourhood. Even today, pollution levels in the area come under scrutiny. Many lives were altered by the Cobalt 60 incident. Not only by the family of the victim, the Jane family were financially crippled by private healthcare costs, and the story is the same for many of the others who were admitted for treatment, as the thought was with the university for selling off equipment far too deadly for public exposure. Thank you for watching, I hope you're all keeping well during these strange times. I hope you enjoyed the video. This subject was second place after David Hahn in a Patreon vote. If you'd like to have a say in future videos, as well as get early access to videos, then you can for $1 per creation. I've also got a PayPal donate link if you fancy buying me a drink, albeit at the moment not from a pub, and I also have Twitter as well. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.